people understand what's really happening today. It's impossible to do it without a grasp for the historical context. And it even goes back before World War II. This really goes back to the World War I period, which is almost never talked about anymore. The Ottoman Empire controlled that part of the world, and it wasn't divided into nation states. There weren't all these artificial boundaries. It was the Arab world under the Ottoman Empire. What happened when the Ottoman Empire collapsed because of European desires to see the Ottoman Empire collapse was a takeover of the Middle East by European interests and then by the United States. And that's when these boundaries, many of which are artificial, many of which have no real relevance to the historical situation in the Middle East, came into play. For instance, take the boundary between Kuwait and Iraq, which brought us to the war in 91. The, the reality is that Kuwait is the 19th province of Iraq. Now, whether that justifies Saddam's policies or whether that justifies uh, the royal family, the emir, um, that isn't the point. The point is that the people in that part of the world see a connection between Iraq and Kuwait, which is not irrelevant to them. And uh, we in the West like to say that these boundaries and these countries must be established the way they are because that's the way we want them to be. In reality, in many cases, the legitimacy is highly questioned, which brings us to Palestine, Israel in the 40s. In the 30s and 40s, the Zionist movement was growing, but all was said to the Arabs, we do not intend to displace you. We do not intend to set up an independent Jewish state. We want to live in peace and brotherhood with you, but we must bring the refugees and the European Jews who want to come to live here uh, to this place, which was then called, everybody called it, Palestine. In, where, in your latest book, which uh, has just come out, which is Exile's Return, I believe, mm -hmm. um, the unusual thing is that after a lifetime of struggle, you are now in opposition to the PLO, in opposition to Chairman Arafat, and uh, feeling, I think, particularly incensed by the agreements that have been made in the recent in recent months. Well, you've actually sort of made a few observations here. Uh, first of all, uh, I have always been in opposition uh, to the policies of the PLO. I've always been uh, incensed, to use your term, uh, against the PLO because of its corruption, its ineptitude, its cynicism over the years. Certainly, its excesses. Certainly, it's uh, uh, the waste uh, uh, of uh, the uh, human and financial resources of the Palestinian people. This past year, things were a lot more difficult than ever before that I have seen. Uh, primarily, the psyche of the people has been extremely devastated. After seven years uh, of intifada activities, people feel that their uh, activities didn't really pay off. Uh, they have been hindered, they have been aborted, and not much has been, not much has been achieved. Uh, the occupation is still there. Uh, the curfews are uh, a daily occurrence, uh, especially in refugee camps. Uh, the blockade around Jerusalem has absolutely made people's movement uh, impossible uh, to and from Jerusalem. It has devastated the social fabric in that Palestinians, let's say, living in Bethlehem, who have to cross Jerusalem to get to Ramallah, cannot visit Ramallah anymore, and vice versa. So the, the occupation and the agreement, which is now in a sense part of the occupation, have really divided city from city, group from group, area from area? Uh, I think the most difficult question that the people are really dealing with, consciously and subconsciously, is that if there is an agreement, if there, if there is a peace process unfolding, why is it that simultaneously the brutalities of the occupation are increasing rather than decreasing? Allah, 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 Allah,
And then when you can pan up to the end of the We're outside the embassy of Saudi Arabia in Washington where there is a very unusual demonstration sponsored by Islamic student organizations in the United States against the Saudi regime, against the oppression uh, that's taking place there and against the very unusual quite massive arrests that have taken place in the last couple of weeks. It's a very restrained demonstration of maybe 40 or 50 people press release that's being handed out and hopefully a spokesman behind me. <laughs> okay. Would you would you tell us about the demonstration yes. and why you've organized it? Yes. This dem demonstration is being organized by uh, many Islamic centers and uh, foundations and groups in this country to protest the recent uh, Saudi government attacks on some scholars, uh, intellectuals, and university professors uh, because they dare to uh, voice their opinion, uh, which had uh, contradictions and uh, criticism to the government of Saudi Arabia. I mean, I was born in that uh, house. I wanted to be there. I knocked on the door. This old man comes out uh, with a... Um, uh, with a heavy uh, East European accent, and he asks me what I want. In Hebrew, I tell him, I, uh, you know, in Eng I ask him, do you speak English? And he goes, yes, I do. And uh, I say, look, I was wondering if you would mind uh, if I just looked around. He, of course, is uh, surprised by my strange, uh, bizarre request. So to edify him, I say, look, you know, I was born in this house. So he lets me in. Uh, and he says, you were born here and you don't speak Hebrew? I said, look, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, not a, I'm an Arab, I'm not a Jew. So he had arthritis and I could tell his arthritic, <laughs> arthritic uh, attack uh, 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 was aggravating. Uh, and then I add, because he, uh, I got flustered, and I add, well, actually, like, you know, it's like, you know, I'm American and I'm, I'm you know, I'm just like trying to visit. Uh, I'm just trying to check, uh, but he, you could tell that he wants me out uh, of the house. Uh, I don't know whose house it was. It's my house, his house, our house, God damn it. It doesn't make a difference. He wanted me out of that yeah. house. Yeah, and, uh, and that, in my view, uh, is a metaphor. The incident is a metaphor about the confrontation uh, between the Palestinians and the Israelis. He is a man who clearly, <coughs> pardon me, who clearly came from Eastern Europe, living in my house, the house that my parents or grandparents had actually built, where I was born. He's telling me to get the hell out of there uh, because it's now his house. If you realize that it was a civil war that broke out in Palestine in the mid-1940s, right after World War II, and we are still living with the ramifications of that civil war, all that's taking place today, in terms of the occupied territories, in terms of making deals between the PLO and Israel, in terms of who has administration here versus who has administration there. That's because this is really one country, whether you call it the Holy Land, whether you call it Palestine, even whether you call it Israel, it doesn't really change the reality that this is one geographic entity that has many claims placed on it. Let's get to the heart of it. Mm. What's your opinion of what has happened uh, in the last year since the uh, Oslo Agreement, since the Washington Ceremony, since the Cairo Ceremony, and since the takeover of the PLO of Jericho and Gaza? Very briefly, I think there's been uh, a debasement, a cheapening uh, of the Palestinian cause. Uh, uh, they uh, have reduced uh, the Palestinian cause to a fragment. Uh, and turned it into an insignificant uh, uh, um, uh, problem uh, 
having to do with uh, civil uh, uh, rights, i.e. the right of the Palestinians in certain parts of Palestine to pick up their garbage and distribute, and, and, uh, distribute their mail and so on and so forth. I mean, the Arab region, in my view, will be out of questions pertaining to culture, to civilization, to prosperity, to modernity for, for quite a long time. It's not the case that there are no talented people there. It's not the case that there are no skilled people. But it certainly is the case that such talents are suppressed, liquidated, marginalized, or basically forced to leave the region. Hamas is not a bunch of crazy Arab radicals killing Jews and refusing peace agreements. Hamas is a legitimate expression of Islamic national interests that goes back a long, long time into the Ottoman period, in fact. And uh, they refuse what they consider to be an agreement with sub which subjugates them, which places them on reservations, which puts them in a Bantustan situation, which leaves the Israeli empire thriving and vibrant, and is supposed to then have Palestinian police, or as the Chicago Tribune uh, a few days ago said, Palestinian cops, taking care of them. Now, I don't share anything theologically with the people in Hamas. I have met some of them by accident on the many trips that I've taken, over 100 trips to Israel and Palestine in the last 15 years. I find them very dignified people, very thoughtful people, people very aware of their history and their heritage, people fighting for their self-determination, for their freedom, for their dignity, just as other people in other parts of the world fight for theirs. But here in the United States especially, we cast them as uh, crazies and terrorists and renegades and killers. You know, we actually do to them the same thing that we did for 20 years to the PLO. And it's time to get beyond all these stereotypes and under the, understand that people have legitimate grievances that they're fighting for. And these legitimate grievances have to all be dealt with if our goal is a stable and just peace. I mean, what about the Israelis? Are they going to give us reparations for all the pain and the suffering they inflicted on us? Four million Palestinians? Huh? They can ask for reparations from the Germans, but we cannot ask for reparations from them? What's going on here? They killed us and massacred us and bombed us and terrorized us over the last half century. And occupied you. And occupied no. us. And I'm talking about the exiles. Right. Now, right. You know? I'm talking about us, the mm -hmm. people who and nobody's talking about. You're watching Mideast Realities. My name is Mark Brzezanski, and our guest is Hisham Ahmed, professor of international affairs, who got his PhD here in the United States, um, but who lives now in Dehesha refugee camp, where he was born, outside of Bethlehem on the West Bank. Life in the occupied territories has not gotten any better. Uh, uh, the occupation is still there, uh, deeply entrenched, uh, sure. Uh, there are uh, soldiers are not seen on the streets of Gaza on a daily basis, but their presence and their influence is constantly felt, and certainly they control people's movement in and out of the strip. Whenever they want to close the gate of this jail, they do. Whenever they want to open it for whatever reason, they do. Uh, they do. Uh, they do that as well. So the occupation is still there in full flag. I mean, full flag. Uh, there are no changes on this front. Whatsoever. But you do foresee changes, don't you? There will be Palestinian police expanding to other cities. There will be a veneer of Palestinian control short of independence. I mean, I use the analogies as a Westerner of Bantu stands and reservations. Do these reservations, do, do these concepts have a resonance with you as well? Indeed they do. Uh, every city, every town, uh, every camp has been turned into a reservation, isolated from the rest. Uh, and that's exactly what autonomy, I mean, in the legal sense, really means. And that occupation, by the way, is extremely brutal. We're not talking about the fact that the Israeli army is just there, you know, uh, policing traffic. The Israeli army is involved in terrible forms of torture, terrible forms of repression, terrible forms of intimidation and has been for a, for a very long time outrageous uh, uh, in terms of what the uh, Israelis say they stand for. And that's why American Jews like myself have been uh, so impelled to speak up against it. 
most of these uh, countries that we call countries in the Arab world are not really countries. Uh, they are artificial creations uh, established there by former colonial overlords. Uh, someone like uh, Churchill in the, in the, um, in the heyday of uh, British uh, power uh, was able to go to, um, uh, to uh, um, our part of the world and say, let there be Jordan. <laughs> and there was a Jordan. Let there be Kuwait. And, uh, and they, <laughs> let there be Kuwait. <laughs> right. The French, in like manner, said, let there be Lebanon, and, and so on and so but forth. But it's more than that. It's let there be the Saudi family ruling Saudi Arabia. We, let there be the Hashemite family. Thank, thank right. you. And uh, it's a question of not only that, but look at it. You mentioned uh, uh, the Saudi family and the Hashemite family. Look at, the, look at how gutsy uh, these families are. Uh, Look at Jordan. What is, what, is the, what is the official name of Jordan? The Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. Right. And look, Saudi Arabia is called this, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. This is the case of two countries that are named after the names of the ruling families mm -hmm. in the manner of medieval fiefdoms. Mm -hmm. In 1948, eight, July 1948, roughly about a million Palestinians were kicked out of Palestine, including my family. You could see these uh, soon-to-be exiles. You could see these uh, million souls trekking up north to seek refuge in Lebanon. Arriving there, harrowed and beaten. You could see them uh, trekking south to seek refuge in Gaza. Arriving equally harrowed and beaten. And you could see them trekking east after they were expelled from the twin cities of Lydda and Ramla by the Israeli forces, led by no other than Yitzhak Rabin, who 30 years later, almost exactly 30 years later, ordered his army to break the bones of the children, of the descendants of these people whom he kicked out. Of course, uh, the Israelis uh, that year, 1948, would have loved for these million Palestinians to trek west and to keep on trekking west to end up in the Mediterranean never to be heard from again. But uh, almost 50 years later, Rabin and the rest of the world uh, has in fact uh, heard from us again and again and again. And these million refugees, exiles, went from being a million, they doubled to two million, they tripled to three million, and now they, are, they have almost quadrupled to four million. But so long as uh, the terminus of Palestinian rights has been defined as a little agreement giving uh, one-fifth the Palestinian people one twentieth of the land. One twentieth of the land. And one tenth of their rights to uh, whatever. Okay, yeah. Then clearly we have uh, a prescription for, a for the continuation of conflict in Palestine. In the because all of these countries are held in bondage by regimes that were placed there, either by the British or by ourselves, none of which have any popular legitimacy, and all of which are involved in forms of intimidation and repression of their own population. It was airplanes being blown up and uh, people in, in Germany at uh, athletic events being killed. Mm. That's what put the Palestinian cause on the map, not intellectuals, not writers, not people appealing for justice and conscience. What is going to put it back on the map? So you're saying the, uh, the sword is mightier than the pen, huh? I'm afraid so. You and you, 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 you and I use... You're talking to a writer. Well, hey, me too. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, we've got to face reality. This is Mideast realities, huh? <laughs> We helped Israel 
develop its nuclear weapons. We, the United States, created the arms race in the Middle East. Now we say to the Arabs, to the Pakistanis, to the North Koreans, that, all, that you're not allowed to have nuclear weapons because the international community has decided, of course, we run the international community on the whole, and if we don't like what they do, we don't pay our bills at the UN. Um, but look at it from an Arab point of view. Why should an Arab say, we 200 million Arabs are not allowed to have modern weapons, which are the token, the currency, of power and influence, but your ally Israel, three and a half million Jews, which works closely with you, they are allowed to have these weapons and to intimidate us with them. My name is Mark Brzezanski. I'm the host of this program. And we're in downtown Washington today. We're on K and 16th, in fact, in the heart of downtown Washington. And we're at the offices of an organization that goes by the name the Council on the National Interest. The very day of the Cairo Agreement, and I was asked that morning by um, Canadian National Television to come down to their studio. And on the way down, I was reading the New York Times. And amidst all the articles about how important this is and what a breakthrough it is, and of course I was already thinking what was I going to say, and I was going to say this is an agreement that's been prepared for a very long time, and it's uh, in keeping with what the Israelis have wanted to do with the Palestinians. It's not quite this unprecedented breakthrough that it's being portrayed as. But I looked at the front page of the New York Times and I said to myself, my God, there's the truth of this. There's no story, there's no analysis. It's all in the picture. And there's this huge picture of the electrified fence that's being used, that's being built and completed all around Gaza, right as the Palestinian police are about to enter. Well, that tells the story. The Israelis were letting Palestinians out of their prisons, sending them to the Gaza prison. But the Gaza prison was going to be a living prison wasn't going to be a prison uh, with, with internal barbed wire and cells, which, and they would have to bring the food in and take care of the prisoners. The Gaza prison, after having destroyed the economy of Gaza, after having beat these people into submission for more than a generation, was now going to be symbolized by this electrified fence. Only those Palestinians cooperative with the Israelis, with their new computerized ID cards and everything, were going to be let out of this prison. The rest were going to be bottled up inside it. Uh, look, PLO is gone. PLO is finished. I mean, it has uh, uh, hardly any support uh, in the West Bank or, and definitely in exile. But it's got all the money and all the guns. Uh, it's got all the money. It's got <laughs> the support uh, as a client uh, regime. It's got the support of the uh, uh, EEC, the United States, and so on and so forth. Um, but uh, no, I do see uh, Islamic activism, not just in Palestine, but the entire Arab world, as the new wave. And I don't think they are going to be cowed by Yasser Arafat either, who is now serving the interests of the Israeli uh, uh, occupation. See, what I'm suggesting to you, the reason that a great many of us, Palestinian Democrats, writers, poets, activists, dismiss this so-called peace agreement is because we think it's a trick. But it's more than a trick. It's more sinister than just a trick. What this agreement is, this harks back to the process of decolonization in the 40s and 50s when the British and the French were granting. Do you remember the term they used to use? We are granting the Algerians independence, you know? Uh, the, the process of decolonization essentially is the British would move out of India or move out of Nigeria or whatever huh, and say, well, we are granting independence to the Nigerian people. But in this um, egregious, uh, sinister process, they leave behind, they leave behind a leadership elite that is subservient to them and is guaranteed to serve their interests forevermore. In other words, uh, this leadership elite will, will be in power hmm, to continue the process of uh, colonization, except in this case, the colonizers are not physically in the country. In other words, the colonizers, in this case the British, will continue to exploit, uh, uh, exploit the labor and the resources of Nigeria 
without them actually being there uh, to, to, to do it themselves. So this is what's been happening in the second, this is the history of the second half of the 20th century, my friends. This is named the struggle of indigenous people, the struggle of oppressed peoples who had been formally colonized, struggling against indigenous elites who are serving the interests of the former colonizers. And this is what Yasser Arafat and the PLO that has been totally corrupted and totally uh, bought by the Israelis and Washington. Sold out. Sold out indeed. Thank you. That sums it up for me.